Bonjour à tous, bienvenue à l'UNESCO. Well, good day to all. Welcome to UNESCO for today's celebration of the World Biodiversity Day. This year, the theme is that the solutions are in nature. They are to be found in nature. Thank you very much to our panel members for being with us here today to talk about a very topical subject in this worldwide crisis that we are experiencing, namely the issue of transformation. What needs to be changed? What can be changed? What transformations are necessary? Which ones are important? What can be envisaged? So the panel is a conversation. It's a dialogue amongst us. And we shall start immediately by putting a question to Paul Liedley a researcher at the Paris-Saclay University, an IPBES expert. And my first question to you as a researcher, what is your view of the crisis that we are currently experiencing? Well, I think that the first comment I would make is a very general one. In the overall assessment by IPBES that came out last year, a very clear statement was made, namely that our health is linked indissociably with the condition or the health of nature. And to be a bit more precise about the current crisis, we know that about 70% of emerging diseases are due to our contact with animals. And among the principal causes of those contacts, we have deforestation and trade in and consumption of wild animals, SARS, Ebola, HIV, and many other diseases that cause a lot of problems to man were caused by those kinds of activities. So, as a scientist and as a citizen, uh, I wouldn't want to say that it's the fault of nature. It's because we go into nature, we consume wild animals, and we interact in an inappropriate way with nature. That's what causes problems. Now, as a scientist, I think that what's very important is that we're seeing once again that our approach is very reactive. We wait for the illness to, to appear on the horizon. We try to limit the spread through lockdown, for instance, and then we start to look for therapies and for vaccines. But I think that we need to be more proactive. Researchers and decision makers must understand that we need to be upstream. We need to identify diseases that could emerge before they emerge, before they spread that we start better to understand the uh, chains of transmission from animals to men and that we prevent such transmission through appropriate actions. And for that, we need much more communication, much more education of citizens, of course, but also of decision makers. And ultimately, all of this will require and that's something that I'm rather afraid of at the present time, because this will require even more international cooperation than in the past. The international transmission of viruses is an international problem, and yet there's a tendency for individual and nation states to close in on themselves. For instance, the administration of the United States has just closed down a research program on the emergence of viral diseases because of some rumors that there is cooperation with the Chinese. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paul Lidley. Irene Hoffman, talking about international cooperation, I turn to you. You're a secretary of the Committee for Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture at the FAO. Do you share some of the viewpoints that have we've just heard from Paul Liedley, and what is your view of the current public health crisis? Okay, my apologies. Ah, voilà, mes excuses. Maintenant, je suis branché. Je suis d'accord avec ce que Paul a dit. Venant de la FAO, je voudrais souligner les aspects sociaux de cette crise COVID. Il y a eu des impacts socio-économiques à une échelle jamais vécue ni même imaginée par aucun de nous. 
L'impact sur les différents groupes est différent. Il y a un approfondissement des inégalités existantes. Euh, il y a eu comme effet une trauma collective, mais nous voyons en même temps de la cohésion sociale et de l'action communautaire à différents niveaux, avec beaucoup de solidarité. Mais nous entrons dans une récession globale avec de plus en plus de pauvreté et d'inégalité, et ceci pourrait bien réduire à néant, néant notre progrès sur les objectifs du développement durable depuis quelques années. Comme Paul l'a dit, il pourrait y avoir un déplacement des priorités. On va euh, cesser de penser du climat, il y aura moins d'argent disponible pour les problèmes environnementaux. Et du point de vue de la FAO, ce n'est pas seulement euh, un problème économique majeur, mais aussi un problème pour la sécurité alimentaire. Il peut y avoir un impact énorme sur l'agriculture, affaiblissement de la résilience locale, et notre message a toujours été qu'il faut assurer la continuité des chaînes alimentaires pour que les gens aient accès à suffisamment de nourriture, parce que être en bonne santé, avoir assez de manger, à manger, c'est essentiel pour une bonne réponse sanitaire, surtout en les pays en voie de développement. Et oui, Paul a raison. La crise à laquelle nous sommes confrontés aujourd'hui, c'est un symptôme ou un résultat de beaucoup de facteurs écologiques, socio-économiques, etc., dans lesquels la sécurité alimentaire et des aspects de ce type-là sont essentiels. Nous sommes vraiment interconnectés. Ce qui est consommé dans une partie du monde peut avoir un impact sur la biodiversité ailleurs. C'est vrai pour le commerce en animaux sauvages, mais aussi pour la sylviculture, la pêcherie, la pêche et l'agriculture traditionnelle. Et les facteurs qui poussent la à la dégradation bio biodiversité sont liés à des mauvaises pratiques agricoles. Nous perdons de la diversité génétique et euh, dans la faune sauvage, mais aussi euh, sur les champs. Il y a eu récemment une évaluation de la forestation en 2020 et aujourd'hui nous lançons un rapport sur la biodiversité dans les forêts et le grand message c'est que la superficie sous forêt est toujours en baisse, mais euh, un peu plus lentement que dans le passé. Ceci veut dire que euh, l'intensification de l'agriculture peut avoir comme conséquence plus de contact entre l'homme et les animaux sauvages et donc euh, inciter ou stimuler la transmission de certaines maladies. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Irène. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pierre-Yves Poulican, as the Director for Sustainable Development in Suez, would you share these uh, rather alarming, rather negative observations that we've just heard? And in your group, in such a large conglomerate, how do you interpret what we are experiencing collectively? And what are your thoughts about this? Would you agree with the uh, alarming negative statements that have been heard uh, just now from Irene Hoffman of the FAO. Good day to all. Indeed, I would agree with what Paul and Irene have said. I mean, it's staring us in the face. We as uh, company representatives don't challenge scientists. We in our company were struck by a number of aspects. First of all, that our employees and the society as a whole are very committed. Our company delivers essential services for life, uh, uh, drinking water, uh, dealing with waste, purifying wastewater, and the services that we provide to citizens have been maintained thanks to a very strong commitment. And in the overall reaction of the company and of the society, 
I see that in France, at least, there has been a lot of energy spent and effort made, not just by Suez employees, but by others, uh, to make sure that things uh, com continue to function. But beyond what Paul and Irene have said, uh, I think it's important to note that there has been uh, an acceptance of certain facts. There, there is more awareness, and we need to take advantage of that. We already committed last fall to a new uh, program calling for 0 0.5 degrees no more. So there is that um, a trajectory that we've entered into, but now we really need to contribute our energy to the appropriate actions all along the value chain. We're going to have to support our clients, support our suppliers, and require from our suppliers that they commit to the same transformation. There are a number of key aspects to this. Many large companies have already committed to the 0.5 uh, uh, degree uh, ambition, but we need to keep up the dynamic, keep up the impetus with everyone involved. Uh, those who cooperate with us, our employees, our suppliers, and our clients, everyone at every level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre-Yves. Thank you for that uh, point of view of a key economic agent in our economy and, in fact, in the worldwide economy. And now I'd like to put the same question to Didier Baba. Would you agree with what has been said, that there is more awareness, that there is a clear uh, scientific assessment of the pandemic and its causes, the link with uh, biodiversity degradation, and uh, you, as the president of the National Committee for the MAB program and in the biosphere in France, but also as uh, the project uh, leader for ongoing uh, negotiations on the worldwide agreement for biodiversity, something that's been put on the back burner because of the pandemic. Uh, none of the negotiations are, are active at the present time, but you've been following these negotiations for a number of years for a new worldwide agreement on biodiversity. So what is your view at the present time, and how would you react to what we've heard from Paul, Irene, and Pierre-Yves? Didier Badin, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good day to all. Uh, I must say that all I can do is validate what has already been said. Indeed, the current crisis that is raging right around the planet is, is very vehement, it's virulent, and it has major consequences. And in fact, it really brings to light uh, uh, some of the links between biodiversity and other ash issues. There are also uh, social aspects, economic aspects. I mean, we're experiencing a complete stop down of the world economy. Half of humanity is locked down, is in lockdown, and we can see all sorts of interdependencies. So I would certainly agree with the scientific point of view, with the UN point of view, and with what we've heard from the private sector, that it is a major crisis. And it is a particularly so, perhaps, uh, in the poorest countries of the world and in the poorest uh, population groups, uh, even in the rich countries. Uh, now, uh, Paul said, yes, we didn't know. But we didn't know, but at the same time, we did. There was an assessment of risk. Our knowledge of zoonoses uh, has been growing over the last few years. Uh, we've evaluated a number of risks. Uh, and in fact, uh, we've now uh, moved from theoretical risk uh, to um, identified risk, to real risk, uh, uh, with uh, extraordinary consequences. So we're confronted with a reality that has gone much further than anything we imagined. The World Economic Forum for a number of years has been evaluating those risks, and surveys uh, carried out among major companies in the world uh, have identified those risks in association with the climate change risk. And here we are confronted with something that has actually occurred. But an important aspect to keep in mind is that at the present time, the investments made to protect biodiversity at the world level represent some 0.1% 
of the world's GDP, 0.1%. But at the same time, it is estimated that the services provided to us by nature are equivalent to 1.5 times the world's GDP. So we're confronted with an extraordinary contradiction. Nature provides all sorts of services to us uh, in terms of food security, in terms of uh, resilience uh, to withstand certain changes due to climate warming, but at the same time we are investing a risibly small amount of uh, money to uh, protect uh, biodiversity. So there is no uh, commensurate relationship between the two, and how can we change that? Uh, that is something that must be done, that must be part of the transformation. There must be a more appropriate investment uh, in order that loss of biodiversity be reduced, that land use be improved, that we cease to degrade ecosystems, that we not industrialize excessively agriculture, for example. Thank you very much, Didier Babin. Would any of you like to react to what we've just heard from Didier on about that particular observation? Do we have a consensus, a shared consensus about the science, uh, the root causes, the causality, that we need to attack those root causes of the pandemic because it has such a tremendous impact on our entire socioeconomic system or systems. Uh, but now, okay, so we have that consensus, but what about the next step? How do we move to action from the diagnosis uh, to action? Perhaps we can start with Paul. What needs to be changed? What can be changed at the same time? Well, once again, in the global assessment of IPES that came out last year, there is an appeal that was signed by almost all countries of the planet uh, to the effect that a profound transformation is required. At the present time, when it comes to biodiversity, we have uh, concentrated on the preservation of uh, biodiversity uh, at a small scale. But what we, what we need is to mobilize uh, all agents, uh, all decision makers, not just the Ministry of the Environment, but also the Minister of Finance, uh, the Minister of Ec the Economy, and so on, and also citizens and companies. Uh, we need uh, uh, to deal with this in a holistic manner, not a fragmented manner. We need to uh, transform society as a whole. Let me give you two examples. The first one is uh, travel. And here I am guilty. I probably travel too much. And what's uh, the connection with biodiversity? Well, uh, the first link is that uh, traveling by airplane or by car is a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions. And scientists believe that climate change is probably one of the main causes of future biodiversity loss. And we've already seen a tremendous impact of climate change on biodiversity. So if we were to start traveling less, that would improve the climate change situation. And in addition, because that's today's subject, uh, all of these trips all around the world contribute to, to causing biodiversity problems and therefore uh, a greater risk of pandemics so we can sort of uh, uh, kill a few birds with the same stone. Uh, so, so I certainly uh, intend to travel less. So of course, we like to travel. We like to meet people face to face, but at the same time we are learning that we can do a lot through video conferencing and I'll be uh, doing a lot more remote work on a daily basis. But let me give you a second example, which is the example of deforestation. We know that that is at the origin of some of our emerging diseases. Now, of course, uh, in France, uh, people might say, what's my problem with all of this? Uh, uh, forest cover is growing in France, there's no problem. But there is, at the same time, a problem of consumption. We need to change our modes of consumption. For instance, 
if you consume palm oil, it's very likely that it came from Indonesia, where a deforestation has uh, been practiced in order to build, uh, to, to grow palm trees. Uh, and if you eat beef in France, it's very likely uh, that the cattle ate uh, soya coming from South America or from Brazil uh, and uh, was produced thanks to deforestation. Uh, if you drink uh, hot chocolate or coffee, that might also have had an impact on the forestation of uh, African or South American countries. So our modes of consumption have a tremendous impact of biodiversity because the way we consume can destroy habitat and that is also a factor that uh, sometimes uh, has a sort of a feedback effect uh, uh, leading to pandemics such as the one we are now experiencing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, Irene, you work at the FAO. This uh, challenge of uh, husbandry, deforestation, agriculture, are there certain things that we should be renouncing now that we can no longer accept or that we should change? En fait, je pense que le monde est trop diversifié pour pouvoir répondre d'une façon simple à votre question. Mais on voit très clairement que cette crise c'est un appel pour accélérer la transformation des systèmes d'alimentation, de la production jusqu'à la consommation. L'investissement dans l'emploi agricole, c'est quelque chose qui peut assurer une sécurité alimentaire à long terme, donc la restauration des terres dégradées, la réparation des écosystèmes, c'est quelque chose qui peut euh, assurer de l'activité économique, préserver la biodiversité et améliorer la qualité des vies. Donc, on peut, en fait, avec les bonnes solutions, résoudre plusieurs problèmes en même temps. Donc, il faut produire plus, mais il faut produire surtout mieux. Et les pratiques agricoles euh, qui sont délétères pour l'environnement doivent être changées. Nous avons préparé euh, un rapport sur l'état de l'agriculture et de la biodiversité actuellement. Et là, il y a une vingtaine de pratiques agricoles qui sont euh, positives pour la biodiversité. Et la mise en œuvre de ces pratiques, ça serait un bon départ. Et la plupart sont spécifiques à certaines localités et exige beaucoup de connaissances. Donc c'est quelque chose euh, qui peut euh, améliorer la cohésion sociale, l'expertise scientifique et technique, mais encore une fois, il n'y a pas de solution magique, de panacée pour tout le monde. Les systèmes euh, alimentaires, agricoles, etc. sont très différents autour du monde. Mais il faut revitaliser les zones rurales les zones protégées, les euh, réserves de biodiversité, comme Paul l'a dit, c'est important, mais ça fait partie de la solution seulement. Il est beaucoup plus important de s'engager avec tous les acteurs pour euh, diversifier les systèmes de production alimentaire, de réduire l'intensification ou l'intensité de l'agriculture et grâce à cela, de protéger la biodiversité dans des terres et des eaux euh, productifs, parce qu'il y a peu de parties de notre globe qui n'ont pas été euh, affectées par l'activité humaine. Mais en même temps, on ne peut pas transformer les systèmes de production dans des musées. Il faut euh, engager les producteurs, les producteurs. Il faudrait que les producteurs puissent vraiment livrer ce bien public qui est la production de la biodiversité. Cela veut dire que tous les agents qui agissent dans le même territoire doivent agir ensemble. Et le défi est politique mais social en même temps. Il faut optimiser les synergies et minimiser les conflits 
entre les différentes demandes sur la nature en général. Et comme Paul l'a dit, il a donné quelques exemples concrets, c'était très bien. Oui, il faut renforcer la production locale, raccourcir les chaînes d'approvisionnement, avoir plus de coopération tout au long de la chaîne d'approvisionnement, mettre en place des nouveaux modèles de business, le commerce électronique entre les agriculteurs et les consommateurs, ça peut être une bonne façon de donner plus de pouvoir à l'agriculteur et avoir des chaînes d'approvisionnement plus courtes. Et je suis d'accord avec Paul, les consommateurs ont besoin de diètes équilibrées et suffisantes pour que tout le monde soit bien nourri et pour que cette interconnectivité de nos chaînes d'alimentation soit vraiment à la, à la, au centre de nos préoccupations. Merci beaucoup, Irène. Pierre-Yves, you have heard that we will no doubt have to change our habits, at least that's what some panelists are saying, perhaps give up on certain things that seemed self-evident. There's a lot said in the 2030 agenda on changing modes of production and consumption. But for you, in a group, in a conglomerate like Suez, what does that mean for possible change, envisageable change in the future? Well, we uh, provide uh, services that are related to water and to waste, so we are very uh, watchful about what clients want from us, and we think that it's necessary uh, to put biodiversity at the same level of concern as CO2. I mean, Paul talked about the relationship between the two, but in terms of communication, there isn't the same awareness when you see today how many companies are working on their greenhouse gas uh, trajectories, uh, well, it's extraordinary, but not many do it with biodiversity. Biodiversity indicators are required in order that we be able to quantify our activities for ourselves, for our suppliers, for our clients. We want to have exemplary models. We want to know how to measure ourselves and how to support our customers uh, in the measurement of what they do, what is their impact when it comes to biodiversity. And we as a company, as Suez, we will be providing solutions to solve uh, uh, some uh, serious uh, problems. Aside, for instance, uh, there was discharge into the sea that uh, resulted in uh, the death of a lot of ocean fauna and flora with plastic bottles uh, floating all the way out to Cyprus. But now we've uh, put in place an exemplary system and that's uh, being cleaned up. Another example in Qatar, well, Doha for years uh, discharged uh, effluents uh, that were fairly toxic in some cases uh, uh, into a 15 square kilometer lagoon. Uh, but we've cleaned that up and we've uh, uh, turned that uh, into a, a protected uh, biosphere reserve with 25 endemic species that have come back, including two protected species. Uh, and you can do a wastewater treatment where at the very last uh, a stage you use, uh, for instance, uh, fauna, dragonflies, and others uh, to do the last stage. So you go beyond the industrial or the chemical cleaning and you use the natural solution as a tertiary uh, solution in order that the wastewater be optimally decontaminated. So, so that uh, uh, rather than doing a purely technical or chemical uh, treatment, uh, you take advantage of an ecosystem to clean up the water. There are all sorts of things that you can do. I mean, I could talk about this uh, for hours, uh, about what we do in Suez. But I think that what's most important here is that uh, biodiversity become uh, a significant, to be perceived as a significant problem that in companies, in municipalities, I mean, those are our clients, uh, that um, our industrial uh, 
uh, clients, uh, our municipal clients, uh, be accompanied, that they be supported. I mean, there is the regulatory framework that is evolving in Europe, there will be an obligatory biodiversity indicator that major companies uh, will have to calculate and publish. So that can result in growing awareness. And the companies like ours that are uh, really involved in ecological transformation, we're at the heart of the revolution, well, we'll be providing uh, certain uh, solutions, we'll be offering solutions to our clients. Thank you. Thank you very much for having uh, shared some of those ideas, having shown that there are solutions out there, that some transformation is already underway, that what's at stake uh, in biodiversity is also an important challenge and opportunity for companies and that everyone needs to be involved. I mean, it's been said that not just the Ministry of the Environment, but all other ministries need to be involved and all social and economic agents need to be involved in a more harmonious management of biodiversity. But now perhaps I could ask Didier Badin when it comes to this appeal for ecological transformation, there is this negotiation among all states of the world of a new agreement on biodiversity. Now you do you share the view that it is necessary that biodiversity be perceived as important as climate change, that there be a global uh, acceptance of that by all societies? And this crisis that we are currently confronted with, that we are experiencing, is that something that could change those international organizations and negotiations and the awareness? Well, to begin with, I'd like to say that I agree 100% with what has been said by the uh, other three panelists. All of these aspects are important and can contribute to improving things. But I might say, to begin with, uh, that the biodiversity agenda that we're working on for 2030 and for 2050 uh, must, be, must take into consideration all of these aspects, uh, and it must be taken seriously, not just by environment or ecology ministers, but in fact by all ministries. We can see that with biodiversity degradation and with this crisis, the consequences are very, very serious in all sectors. So it's absolutely necessary that, that governments become fully aware that they take on board the importance of paying attention to biodiversity. Otherwise, there can be major unfavorable negative impacts. So there's the Convention on Biodiversity, uh, but there are other events, uh, for instance, uh, the summit on um, uh, food uh, security production to be organized by the FAO, the summit of the United Nations on nature in September. And th there are all of these uh, discussions uh, concerning the achievement of the SDGs. Uh, well, their biodiversity must be must be taken into consideration with a commitment also by local communities. I mean, they are the concrete agents for implementation of the required actions. So we have opportunities. Now, will this crisis change things? Yes, no doubt. And I hope, and I hope it will be in the right direction. But it's, it could also be a problem. I mean, it's been said that a massive and rapid reinvestment in the economy is required. Well, yes, but will it be done properly? Will we finally bring to an end uh, subsidies that are nefarious for biodiversity and climate change and reinvest that money in a positive way? I mean, we have the money. There are hundreds of billions of dollars or euros invested every year in subsidies that are very damaging 
for biodiversity and climate change. Uh, so if that could be diverted to the right kind of investment uh, with the right political will, then that would be positive. I mean, that investment needs to be reoriented. The other thing that is important is that biodiversity should not be looked at only from the point of view of conservation. It's always been considered that nature conservation is significant, but no, biodiversity is a set of solutions for a sustainable development, for green jobs, for the prosperity of the world's population. And what we really need to take into consideration is the biodiversity action plans, not in their isolation, but rather as means of achieving all of the sustainable development goals, including food security, uh, issues uh, relating to urbanization, uh, agriculture, what are the best solutions that can be offered uh, by uh, nature to achieve what we want to achieve. But there's another aspect that is uh, fundamental. How do we promote the transition? How do we move from uh, the point in time where we have the diagnosis, we have the observation, uh, to the time when we actually act? Uh, Yes, we will need uh, for a certain period of time to invest in the transition. You can't ask a city or a company or a group of consumers to change from one day to the next. They must be supported in that change. And a number of studies have been carried out that show that if you uh, invest appropriately over uh, 10 years or so, the additional costs are recouped very, very quickly. So we're at a crossroads. We're going to be reinvesting a lot in the economy, and this really is the right time to change the way we invest, the way we assist enterprises, companies, consumers, producers, uh, and uh, the international arena as well. And that is what the Biodiversity Convention should be doing. I mean, we need to promote what is being done well, to stimulate people to go even further, but in particular to assist those who want to change, sometimes constrain them to change when that's necessary, to get them to move in another direction. And for that, they need to be assisted. This transition, which uh, some uh, people are referring to as the ecological solidarity transition, well, it must be done uh, as an economic and social transition as well. We can't just change in one sector uh, in a fragmented way. It has to be holistic. It has to be systemic. We have to act on all of the aspects at the same time, and this must be done over the medium and the long term. Uh, it'll be done over a 10-year period, perhaps in some cases a 20-year period in cities uh, to change the way waste is managed, uh, the way uh, the city is supplied with uh, water, with food, etc., the transport system, all of this needs to be, all of this needs to be changed. And you, we will need to monitor this, which means having the right indicators in order to make sure that we can monitor whether from the time of the commitment through the time of the investment, uh, the results really are achieved. And to monitor, we'll need the right indicators in order to see whether the investments that have been promised are in fact uh, made, uh, whether the various agents take their responsibilities, and whether they achieve the results. Well, thank you very much, Didier. So for you, the crisis is also an opportunity to change, to to transform, to rethink our systems, in particular our economic systems, to make them more harmonious vis-à-vis -vis biodiversity. Uh, Irene, do you see in the crisis that we're experiencing uh, also an opportunity? Would you see it in that manner? En fait, oui, je suis d'accord avec ce que Didier vient de dire. Et je pense qu'il y a des opportunités dans cette crise. Nous avons vu qu'il y a plus d'innovation, ce que Paul a mentionné tout à l'heure. La distanciation sociale a stimulé 
l'apprentissage électronique à distance, moins de voyages, le travail à distance, la numéris numérisation en général. Donc, je pense qu'il y a beaucoup d'opportunités pour changer notre façon de faire les choses, non seulement en termes de numérisation, mais les autres formes d'innovation aussi. Nous avons appris aussi à nous adapter euh, à des nouvelles choses. La pollution, les émissions sont dramatiquement à la baisse actuellement. Est-ce que ceci nous euh, montre comment nous pouvons continuer à faire cela avec tous les aspects positifs pour la santé humaine et l'environnement Didier a parlé déjà de ces différentes manifestations qui devaient avoir lieu en 2020. L'année 2020 devait être la grande année pour la nature, mais à cause du Covid, il y a beaucoup de manifestations qui ont été repoussées à 2021. C'est peut-être une opportunité de dire que nous avons maintenant un biennium pour la nature, pas seulement un an, mais deux ans. Pouvons-nous en profiter pour faire des messages très forts, séparément et conjointement, pour donner plus d'importance à la biodiversité dans la conscience humaine. La crise a montré aussi que les inégalités et les inefficacités dans le système de production alimentaire ne peuvent pas continuer. Tout le monde dit que continuer comme avant, ce n'est pas une option. Oui, d'accord, mais comment transformer nos modes de euh, production et de consommation quelles sont les bonnes politiques à mettre en œuvre pour cela J'ai toujours été en faveur euh, du fait que l'agriculture et les utilisateurs euh, durables doivent être à la table quand nous négocions les actions pour l'avenir. C'est la meilleure façon de s'assurer que euh, tout le monde fera, portera attention à la biodiversité euh, et peut-être que nous avons un peu plus de temps pour bâtir ensemble un mouvement de ce type. À la FAO, nous travaillons avec beaucoup d'organisations différentes et la décennie sur la restauration euh, des écosystèmes des Nations Unies, ça sera encore une occasion de travailler ensemble. Et finalement, il y a beaucoup de gens qui disent que nous devons rebâtir meilleur. Mais pour moi, ce n'est pas suffisamment ambitieux. Je pense que nous pouvons vraiment transformer vers une planète verte, une économie complètement verte. Et comme Didier a dit, nous, les pays, les sociétés du secteur privé, comment investissons-nous à long terme pour assurer une bonne alimentation des systèmes d'éducation, des services de santé publique qui sont vraiment inclusifs et qui euh, permettent à des sociétés d'être résilientes pour récupérer rapidement et quels sont les types d'emploi, de sécurité sociale dont nous avons besoin pour cela. Comment créer une bioéconomie circulaire Ce mot « circulaire », c'est un mot qu'on utilise depuis une vingtaine d'années et maintenant nous avons l'occasion d'en faire quelque chose de concret. Profiter des systèmes alternatifs, les insectes, la production hydroponique, les protéines microbiologiques, les algues, il y a plein de choses qui nous permettraient de mieux gérer la biodiversité et de combiner cela avec des innovations qui permettraient à tout le monde d'avoir une vie plus saine et plus sûre. Merci, merci beaucoup Irène. En fait, comment appuyer, comment épauler cette transition dont Didier a, mentionné, a parlé Avons-nous ce qu'il faut pour cela? Uh, Pierre-Yves, we have talked about innovation, about adaptation, about opportunities, 
that are emerging as a result of our experience over the last two to three months. We've talked about the future. How do you see those opportunities? And how do you see the transition within your group, within Suez? Well, I have uh, the same responsibility within the group as all of us vis-à-vis uh, -vis the outside world. Yes, uh, we need to support this. We need uh, to insist on the right decisions being taken within the group. And the CEO of the group has made that commitment last fall in CO2 uh, terms. He signed uh, this uh, 0.5 degree ambition. And this uh, transformation, it's complicated, it's demanding, but will succeed if we manage it to achieve a consistency of uh, decision making at all levels and at all times. And my role is to offer tools and solutions. Uh, my group is changing its value proposal vis-a-vis -vis clients. Uh, one of the thrusts, uh, health, the circular economy, CO2, and biodiversity, those are the not the four, the five thrusts that we concentrate on. And how can we build our value proposal to the clients? Uh, how can we build it around those five thrusts? Uh, we have this uh, historic uh, business uh, of water, purifying water, protecting the planet, uh, but there are these additional requirements at the present time. So, so, so we're very much uh, on the bandwagon. Iran has uh, mentioned that uh, 2020 really was to be biodiversity year, uh, and I uh, discovered uh, that when I all sorts of important uh, meetings when I uh, took on board this uh, job. Uh, I mean, uh, there is the climate COP that has uh, takes place every year, whereas the biodiversity COP is only once every four years. Uh, I was at the IUCN uh, meeting in Marseille, and, and uh, I've interacted uh, with this, uh, and we've heard about the relationship uh, between the investment in uh, biodiversity and how important biodiversity is, and did we talk about it only four years? I mean, if I talked about something once every four years in my company, people would forget from one time to the next. So this morning we had a uh, video conference meeting uh, with uh, some of my people, and we talked about biodiversity indicators. I mean, that's very complicated. Uh, the CO2 is simple. I mean, it's standardized. I mean, behind those standards, there's a lot of technique, there's a lot of technology, of course. Uh, but we need to uh, make biodiversity accessible to citizens, to industrialists, uh, so that they can measure, they can quantify their actions. Uh, Paul has talked about traveling. Everyone uh, can find a direct uh, link between a trip and the number of tons of CO2 that are consumed, but for biodiversity, those indicators don't exist. It's much more complicated, and yet it's much more important. So I think that that is absolutely clear. Clicky. We as a company have our role to play. We have 90,000 employees. You can imagine uh, how difficult it is uh, for us uh, uh, to get our employees uh, to change the way they operate. That's not easy. It's a, it's a major cultural shift. Uh, we're working on this. And in the complementary, in a complementary economic ecosystem, like a city or a local community, to put bio biodiversity at the heart of concerns is not self-evident. It's so complicated. I mean, we need specialists. For instance, we cooperate with the Natural History Museum in France. We have a number of other traditional partners who have a lot of expertise when it comes to biodiversity. Uh, and, and so I think you, you need this uh, mix of the company expertise, the scientific expertise, uh, the NGOs, uh, the researchers. It all needs to be put together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre-Yves, for sharing that with us. I'd like to turn uh, now to Paul because uh, Pierre-Yves, has mentioned uh, something very important, namely that biodiversity is complex. Perhaps not complicated, but it is complex. And what can we do 
to take advantage of the crisis despite that complexity. I mean, we know about the causal, causal relationship between human action and, and the pandemic, uh, uh, the modes of production and consumption, the way we feed ourselves, our travel. But for you, Paul, what is the major opportunity to be taken advantage of at the present time? Well, among the opportunities, and I think uh, Irene said this uh, quite rightly, this was to be the year of uh, nature and biodiversity, but I think we have an opportunity better to think about our ability to get everyone on board for this. There are many people who are beginning to discover what's at stake in biodiversity and it would be a good thing that next year there be even more awareness of this for the COP15 which is the major meeting of all governments for the biodiversity convention and in order that it be understood by everyone that this is crucial and not just for the conservation of nature. I mean, biodiversity doesn't just mean saving nature. It's taking advantage of the services that nature offers us, which are extraordinary services. Nature must be seen as something that is positive, that can offer us solutions to protect our health, to help us to produce food, in a more sustainable way, better food, to improve the quality of our life. I think that this crisis uh, this year is an opportunity better to think about these issues and better to mobilize all of those involved. We're not going to be able to solve these problems uh, with a few decisions uh, taken at a high level with some imposed regulatory framework nor by individual action at the grassroots level uh, we need uh, the, the two we need uh, a whole set of actions we need public uh, policies at the international and national levels uh, but also uh, appropriate action by each and every individual if this transition uh, to good biodiversity is to be a success. Thank you very much, Paul. So everyone can act, uh, should act, must act, uh, is responsible. That's a good message. I mean, we'll summarize things uh, at the end. But maybe you, Didier, would like to add a few words about what's just been said. Are there other opportunities to be grasped? Well, I think that there is another opportunity. Up to now, biodiversity is not something that was very well known among decision makers. Now, unfortunately, we have this crisis. But it is showing us, it is demonstrating to us to what extent biodiversity is important and not taking into consideration, not respecting biodiversity can have major nefarious consequences. We've had the impression over the last few years that there is a growing awareness of the importance of biodiversity. Uh, it was visible in the reports, it was visible in, in the graphs and the curves, in the discourse of scientists, uh, but perhaps uh, not understood by everyone. And now we're confronted with something very concrete and we have to be very pragmatic to find the right solutions. Uh, so what's at stake now is to link up a good way of approaching biodiversity and not just uh, preserving it but using it in a more sustainable way and we need to uh, rewrite the contract if you will between uh, man and nature between humanity and the planet and we can go beyond the development models that we've had so far. We can see, see things differently and we can achieve uh, prosperity, viability and resilience for all. And this must all be written into the new project 
to be negotiated at the international level, but also within companies and within local communities, because everyone has her or his contribution to make experience to be taken advantage of. And maybe just a few words about biosphere reserves in the MAP program, the Man in the Biosphere uh, Man in the Biosphere program. Some 700 biosphere reserves around the world are trying out various projects that combine the social, the economic, and the scientific. Uh, there are these experiences, there are many others. Uh, we're not starting from scratch. We have all sorts of attempts that have been made within individual companies concerning certain technical solutions, as Irene has said. And, and, and all of this must be brought to bear on the global project. So we have an opportunity, we have these this open door uh, and everything that we've been developing up until now in a, an excessively discreet manner should be brought to the fore and really uh, provide inspiration. And, and I think that we need to uh, work on the basis of new paradigms for the implementation of these projects, not just for us, the adults, but especially for uh, the upcoming generations. These uh, crises may well be repetitive. They may well come uh, back over and over again. I mean, if we don't change it, uh, then the planet will become less and less hospitable. Well, thank you. Thank you, Didier. I'd like to thank you and every one of you, all four of you, for having participated in this panel discussion under rather special circumstances, unusual circumstances. We can't see each other face to face. We're dependent on technology. And nevertheless, we've managed to come together to try to think together, uh, also to celebrate this World Biodiversity Day, to underscore the crucial importance of biodiversity in our daily lives. I think we all experience this in our uh, social interactions with our families, in our professional work, in our companies. There's also a message of hope that has been transmitted. Uh, there is an understanding of the link to biodiversity degradation of this pandemic the way that we look at living things, at uh, nature, uh, perhaps uh, will change, it must change. Uh, companies are prepared to change. Uh, nature is not just a scientific object. Uh, Pierre-Yves has told us that companies want to act, that they're prepared to act uh, faster. So there is uh, a mobilization of uh, many agents, I mean in France, uh, in the press, but elsewhere as well. There have been many articles about the link between the pandemic crisis uh, and biodiversity. So there is a growing awareness. There is therefore this opportunity to bring people together, to share different points of view. That was the objective of this panel, to show also that we do have the solutions. The solutions are within us. They are within us and they're in nature. They can be uh, implemented on a planetary scale. It is possible to rewrite the contract between us and nature uh, to uh, reconcile uh, with um, the fauna and the flora to find solutions that really work and to think together in all sectors, the economy, finance, uh, agriculture, uh, food production, and to see what we can do, to think about what we can do to uh, find ourselves in a world where we are all more respectful of one another and of nature, where we are more ecological, where we systematically think of the consequences for nature of our political, social, economic, and personal choices. I mean, it is, uh, nature is our home, our common home, uh, and there is a tremendous uh, impact uh, 
negative impact on our individual lives when we upset the equilibrium of nature. So thank you. Thank you once again. This uh, dialogue will continue. UNESCO will invite you over the next uh, weeks and months uh, to reflect uh, with us about where we find ourselves in this uh, necessary uh, transition. So uh, good fortune and thank you very much once again for having participated.